Greetings, everyone. Yep, it's me, Jared Taylor from the Biology 112 teaching team here at UBC. Today, I would like to introduce you to the concept of information flow. Information flow is the answer to the question, how? How do cells use their information? To be technical, the term information flow is just another name for what is properly known as the central dogma of molecular biology. However, since walking around saying things like the central dogma of molecular biology isn't likely to get any of us invited to parties, we will stick with the term information flow. In order to talk about information flow, let's return to some of the topics that we covered in previous videos, that is, nucleic acids and proteins. If you recall, nucleic acids are all about information and proteins are all about function. Let me say it another way. The sequence of bases in a nucleic acid, especially DNA, stores the instructions that tell a cell how to make and do things. The sequence of amino acids in a polypeptide chain provide the instructions for the protein to fold properly and start making or doing things. So this begs the question, how do cells go from information in storage to information in action? In other words, how do we go from DNA to protein? Well, let's dive into the answer although first let me simplify the sequences shown on the screen. To convert information into action, from DNA to proteins, cells use two steps, transcription and translation. This requires a middleman function that is fulfilled by RNA. This RNA, known as messenger RNA, or mRNA for short, serves as a temporary information transfer and decoding molecule. What is shown here on the screen looks simple but in reality is quite complex with a number of moving parts. Let me talk about each level of the information flow in turn to break things down somewhat. At the top level is the information stored in the DNA, which must be read and used in some way. The enzyme that handles this function is RNA polymerase, and its product is the mRNA molecule that we saw a few moments ago. To read the DNA, the RNA polymerase requires a few special sequences besides the code that we are interested in. The first DNA sequence that the polymerase needs is known as a promoter. This is the region of DNA that allows the RNA polymerase to land and dock with the DNA. The promoter ensures that the RNA polymerase is pointed in the correct direction to read the desired code. The position of the promoter also helps to find what is known as the plus one site. This represents the place where the RNA polymerase will start reading and adding bases. Finally, a terminator sequence is needed to tell the RNA polymerase when to stop reading the DNA. By the way, these DNA elements together with the information code are the basic features of what we call a gene. To start reading the DNA, the polymerase binds to the DNA using the promoter region. How this occurs is something we will cover in detail during Biology 112 lecture. Once in place, the polymerase is ready to start adding bases at the plus one site using one of the two DNA strands as a template. But which strand should it use as the template? Well, like all polymerases, RNA polymerases read DNA from three prime to five prime and make a new complementary strand in a five prime to three prime direction. Looking at the DNA strands on the screen, we can see that when the RNA polymerase moves towards the information code, it is the bottom strand that is in the correct 3' prime to 5' prime direction. Thus, as shown on the screen, the bottom strand will be the template strand. By the way, the other DNA strand is, somewhat confusingly, known as the coding strand. It is so-called because its sequence matches the sequence of the mRNA product that will be made from this gene. More details about this will be covered in Biology 112 lecture, so let's move on. The RNA polymerase moves from the promoter towards the terminator, making the new mRNA as it transcribes. This seems like a good segue into talking about the mRNA. The mRNA, like the DNA before it, is storing information, and this level of decoding the information is known as translation. As its name suggests, this stage is all about directly translating the language of nucleic acids into the language of proteins. In other words, this is the true stage of protein production. The primary enzyme that handles this protein production is known as the ribosome. 
The ribosome has two main subunits known as the large subunit and the small subunit. We will talk about these in a few moments. First, let's talk about the mRNA itself. Again, like the DNA before it, it too has some required sequences. The first thing is the code itself. This corresponds to the information sequence that is contained in the coding strand and made from the template strand in the DNA. The next required element is known as the ribosome binding site, or RBS for short. As the name exactly suggests, this is where the ribosome will bind. The start codon is the location where the ribosome starts reading the code and adding amino acids to the polypeptide chain. The start codon always has the sequence AUG and always codes for the amino acid methionine. Finally, the stop codon tells the ribosome when to stop making the polypeptide chain. Please note that the stop codon does not correspond to any amino acid in the final protein. With all of these features available, the ribosome can assemble on the mRNA and begin to produce the polypeptide chain that will fold into the final protein product. Armed with all of this information, we can now revisit the previous information flow schematic. Notice that it is quite a bit more involved now that all of the different features have been added. By the way, I didn't mention this earlier, but what I have shown here relates mostly to bacteria cells. Eukaryotic cells have some additional features and steps that we will discuss during Biology 112 lecture. And that is a whirlwind introduction to information flow in cells. In an upcoming video, I will introduce the concept of gene regulation and discuss some of the ways that cells can control information flow and protein production.